Good morning, Dr. Lisa Harvey-Smith. So what brought you here at CSIRO? Well, I work at CSIRO on an amazing project and it's called Square Kilometre Array, uh, or the SKA for short. And the Square Kilometre Array is the world's biggest telescope and it's going to be made of thousands of smaller radio telescopes that work kind of as a big army uh, to study the night sky in unprecedented detail. So what scientific discoveries do you expect to make with SKA? Well, the SKA will do an enormous amount of science and there are thousands of different projects that we could possibly do, but the really key science projects are, include looking through the history of the universe and understanding some of the fundamental forces. Um, now, we know that a lot of the universe is affected by something very mysterious called dark matter. And dark matter seems to have a gravitational uh, influence on the universe, but we can't see it and it doesn't seem to interact with anything. Um, and we know that it makes up a large part of the universe. So solving this mystery will be one of the great things that the SKA helps to do. Another great thing the SKA uh, should do is look at the very, very cosmic dark ages just after the Big Bang, when there were no stars or galaxies at all, and the universe was just completely full of this um, sort of paste of hydrogen gas, very boring, and there were no stars or galaxies. So what we want to do is look back to that time and see how the stars and galaxies were born just after the Big Bang. How big is the telescope? Well, the telescope, incredibly, is uh, in two parts, and one is in Australia and one is in southern Africa. And these two parts sort of work at, as, a, as a whole um, to, to provide us with an unprecedented view of the sky. Now, the part in Australia will be maybe 20 kilometres across, uh, and the one in South Africa um, may stretch right throughout Africa of thousands of kilometres. So, in fact, it's a really, really huge telescope, the SKA, covering thousands of kilometres of the Earth's surface. Wow. How many countries will be involved in this project? It's an international project, uh, which is a really good thing because uh, we get the expertise from all different countries uh, and the knowledge is shared throughout the world. And at the moment, there's about uh, 10 or 11 countries actively involved, uh, hoping to fund the telescope internationally in that way. Tell me about the uh, SK Pathfinder telescope. I have heard about Pathfinder. Yeah, Pathfinder is uh, basically a prototype, um, so it's a practice run uh, building a telescope on the SKA sites in Australia and in South Africa um, and practicing the technologies that we'll need to build this enormous vast telescope for the future. So what we've done here in Australia is build the Australian SKA Pathfinder telescope and it's called ASCAP. It's a bit of a long acronym but what it is is 36 giant satellite dishes in the desert and those are pointed at the sky and they work all together as a team. Uh, and they build us up a big, big picture of the sky. And there are other pathfinders. Uh, there's the Murchison Wide Field Array project, which is a low frequency uh, telescope. And that's helping us to understand things like the, the sunspots on the sun and also the history of the universe. Um, it's an incredible project. And then thirdly, there's one in South Africa called Meerkat. And that's a, a big telescope, uh, 64 dishes in the, in the, d the desert out there. So there are lots of Pathfinder projects and they're all working uh, towards the SKA. That's very cool. So what's Australia's role in this ASCAP and SKA? So Australia is a host of the SKA. It's a partner member of the international organisation. It's also leading uh, the design of the dishes and other components of the telescope. And we've also built the Australian SKA Pathfinder telescope, uh, ASCAP. And ASCAP is going to do some amazing science surveys over the next five years. Um, we're going to discover about 600 million galaxies like our own. And we're going to look at galaxies' history throughout about half uh, the age of the universe. So that's a pretty incredible claim already. Um, and all that's just building up to the, the eventual aim, which is to build this huge international telescope. What are the challenges uh, you assume associated with this project? Oh, it's very difficult to um, run an international project um, because there's so many great ideas and, and so many different teams. Um, so some of the practical challenges can, can be in that. Um, some of the challenges on the ground, these sites are very remote in, in Africa and in, in Australia. The telescope wants to be in a remote location because um, it, it has to be radio quiet. So the telescope needs a quiet environment in which to live, to listen to the very faint radio signals from the universe. Um, so building a big infrastructure like a telescope in those environments can be challenging. Um, but we've done it here and we're 
the South Africans have also done it successfully. So all that work has been building towards um, the, the building these great observatories. Great. So I would like to ask you, what inspired you to become a scientist? Oh, what inspired me? Um, the night sky, essentially. Just I grew up in a rural area of England, and um, when I went outside at night, I could just see the night sky incredibly brightly. And um, I went out with my dad and had a look for Halley's Comet in 1986, and it was cloudy and raining a bit like today. Um, but I still remember looking for the comet. I, I didn't see it, but that was one of the formative um, moments in my young life. Uh, and after that, I just really got excited by astronomy and, and decided to make it, my, make it my career. And I'm really glad that I did. That's incredible to know. Do you have any role model or would you give some credit to someone who gave you this like path of being a scientist? Yeah, role models are incredibly important, aren't they? And I mean, I, I used to get inspiration from the, the astronauts. I remember meeting Helen Charman once, who was the first British uh, female astronaut. And that was very, very inspiring. And I was inspired by the moon landings as well, even though I wasn't born then. But watching the, the tapes back um, when I was young was very, very inspiring. And also the people who help you, um, like the Braintree Astronomical Society, just a small um, club, astronomy club for amateurs in England that I joined when I was about 12. Um, those guys really helped me. I've, I've got some lifelong friends from that that society so you know all these people who do outreach and, and work in astronomy amateur astronomy um, uh, really can make a big difference and I, I hope they know that Wow, great I know that you have become one of the top 100 most influential people in Sydney in 2012 Apparently. and I was yes that's really <laughs> great and also I know that you're the chair of astronom women in astronomy for Astronomical Society of Australia so what's your role and how do you see this and what would be your comment on this for women in science and women in astronomy? Well, we know that women are doing really, really well in school and science and maths and actually outperforming um, boys in many areas, um, but that's not translated through the chain and there are a number of societal reasons for that, um, which are really a legacy from the past, I think. But women are still impacted in their careers. Um, by a number of factors and um, we think it's really important in the women in astronomy chapter to have a look, an honest look at how uh, we can change that. So we uh, launched a, an award scheme last year, the Pleiades Awards, named after the Seven Sisters, the little group of stars um, that people may know. And um, the Pleiades uh, uh, Awards are about um, rewarding institutes where professional astronomers work um, when they change their, their culture and when they change their procedures and policies to make the workplace better for women. Fantastic. You were talking about something um, deep sky. So are we alone in this universe? What's your comment on this? People often ask me if we're alone in the universe. And I mean, we have no evidence either way. And that's the first answer. That's the boring answer. Yeah. But secretly, I'm going to tell you, no. I think that there absolutely has to be life uh, out there. I mean, we've looked up now with telescopes at other stars and measured planets. We've found thousands of planets around other stars. So how can we possibly live in a universe with hundreds of billions of planets and none of them have life. I just don't think that's plausible. So I think it's just a matter of time uh, and we'll find those. And do you think SK will keep some, SK will help us uh, in knowing are we alone or not? Well, the SKA's, uh, one of the key science projects is are we alone in the universe? And that's not only looking for signs of technological civil civilizations via radio wave, um, which we could find, possibly in the nearest 50 light years, um, we could even see things like airport radars, um, like we use here on Earth. Um, but the other thing is we can look for the chemistry of life um, and the chemical fingerprints of life in disks around other stars where planets and solar systems are forming. So we've got this really great opportunity with the SKA telescope to look for signs of life in the universe. Pretty cool. Oh, yeah, it is. And it's pretty cool for me that I know you are an ultra marathon runner as well. So how do you manage all these projects and you do science as well? Yeah, not very well. It's a, it's a busy life, but you know, if you don't watch television and you, don't, you try not to waste too much time, you can, you can actually achieve a lot. So I find that life's a balance between you know, your social life and your, your hobbies and all those sorts of things and your work. And, and when your work's your passion, I think that's quite easy to manage.
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lisa Harvismint, for taking your time for us on this Friday morning. You're very welcome.